Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man that just got his DNA results back, and it turns out he's 80% beer. It's Dale. <laughs> well, damn, I need to shoot for hire. <laughs> How's it going, man? I'm great, bud. How are you? That was pretty good. I like that one. I hear you. I'm doing well, doing well. Whew, just tired. I've been yep. working a lot, man, but uh, I'm ready to jump in here and get something going that's it do another episode do another episode yeah you got any shout outs for us man oh uh, yeah we got a few I'd like to give a shout out to uh spooky world on uh youtube man thanks for those cool comments on uh on the high fire murders case and uh that was pretty cool you jump in there and leave us a comment and we want to have a shout out to uh jimmy james prophet that's a new listener who climbed on board and went to welcome you to the crack house family and more of a shout out a big thank you donna we got to give a big thank you to uh benjamin richardson man he sent us a, a big old box of stuff. A care package. Yeah, that, that was the word I was looking for. <laughs> it was really cool. He's t- taking care of us, man. Some uh, some coffee and cigars and stuff that uh, he actually grew on his own his own farm. In Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, man. And that was really, really, really cool of you, man. I appreciate it so much. And just to remind me that he has invited us to come down there to stay at his home in Puerto Rico. He has? Yeah. Pre-pandemic. Yep. So. But, you know, we hadn't forgot about that invite, Ben, and we will get down there. Yeah. We're going to come hang out, man. We're going to hang out on, in Puerto Rico. That'd be cool. That's it. And we want to remind everybody to, if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star. Yeah, five-star, babe. Rate and review. That's click about that, the only place you can do it, ain't it? Yeah, click that five-star button. I think you can do it on uh, Audible. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, do that, man. It would really help us out. Push us up in there so if more folks can find us. Exactly. We we always get a you know a, an email or a comment. Somebody's just stumbled upon us and... And they, they kind of dig it, so if we could help a few more people stumble, we'd be good to go. Yeah, we're always stumbling around here. <laughs> and uh, check out the store page, get you a t-shirt, get you a crack house mug, get you something to support the show. That's right. And if you just want to throw a few dollars, you can just go to our website and hit the gas money button and chunk a few dollars that way if you want. Yeah, because we need some gas money. We take it. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, man. We are going to get in our episode this week. Let's roll it, man. And Dale, we're just going to start out with, you know, our story that we're going to talk about starts on May the 31st of 1985. Yep. And it was this time, and it's taking place in Lexington, South Carolina. This is when 17-year-old Sherry Smith had just finished her senior year of high school. Right. And she was getting excited. She was getting ready to go on a cruise. Uh, graduation was just a couple of days away. Yeah, two days. Yeah, and she was going to sing the national anthem right. at graduation. Wow. So she had a lot of things going on, starting a new chapter in her life. A lot of positives going on with it. Yep. But on this particular day, on May the 31st of 85, she was at a pool party, like a celebratory pool party graduation type like a senior gimmick of some sort yeah, yeah she was there with her boyfriend and i think they'd hung out most of the day probably i think but, this was on a friday too right yeah. yes yeah. and that afternoon around three o'clock she had called her mom to tell her she was on her way home right uh, this was pretty cell phone days yeah and that's something that their family did it was all it was a pretty pretty close family and Always took care of each other and let each other know where they were and what was going on. So, you know, so she'd give her a call and say, I'm on my way home, so expect me in a certain, certain time. Yep. Now, just a little bit of background on Sherry. She was born on June the 25th of 1967 to parents Hilda and Robert Smith. But uh, Robert went by Bob, and he is not the lead singer for The Cure. Oh. Yep. In Columbia, South Carolina. Now, Sherry was the middle child. She had an older sister, Dawn. And a younger brother, Robert Jr. Robert Jr. Now, Dale, this family were very tight. They were very religious Mm -hmm. and pretty active in their church and community. Yeah. Christian folks. Yeah, very, very Christian. And they had a very strong faith. There was no doubt about it that we're going to talk more about later on in this episode. The friends and family could always count on Sherry to be positive in her attitude. She was always smiling and just had a, you know, just a good way about her. Even when somebody was feeling down, they were, she was always, always there for them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Always. <laughs> always. Yeah. There. And, and her and her and Dawn, they, they did the, the singing thing and they were, they were aspiring to be uh, pretty famous in the Christian music uh, yeah. genre there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They were wanting to take that path. Yeah. 
Now, on this afternoon that she was on her way home from the pool party, she had stopped at the end of her road. Her driveway. At the end of her driveway. Yeah. And they lived on Platte Springs Road in Lexington, South Carolina. Now, this was about 3.38, just a little after 3.30 in the afternoon. Right. And they had a pretty long driveway. I've heard anywhere it was about 750 feet from the road. Yeah, that's pretty long. Yeah, from the main road out there. Pretty good hike. But she stopped at the driveway to get the mail. Yeah. At the, I don't yeah. blame her. You wouldn't want to walk back. Huh? No. Uh-uh. <laughs> and I'm sure they did that a lot. They stopped at the road. Oh, yeah. To get the mail, then drive on into the house. And it wasn't like a big, windy, long driveway. It was pretty much a straight shot to the house. You could see, you know... There's a photo. We'll post a photo of uh, her car sitting there, and, and you can see the the house plane. I mean, yeah, straight away, straight away. So it's not like it's back in the woods. I mean, it it's sitting way off the road, but it's just a straight shot. Yep. Now, when Sherry pulled into the driveway, her dad Bob was. I guess he had a home office there. He had spotted her pulling into the driveway and get out of the car. Yep. To get the mail. And he didn't think anything about it. He just, you know, went back to working. Yeah, normal thing. Yep. And just a few minutes later, maybe five or ten minutes later, he realized that Sherry hadn't come in the house. Right. Kind of weird there. Yep. And he looked out the window again, and he saw her car sitting. Still sitting there. In the same place. Right. Sitting at the end of the driveway next to the mailbox. And With the door open. Yeah, the door was wide open. And he was thinking, you know, what was taking her so long? Right. Now, didn't she have some kind of medical issues? She had a rare form of diabetes, as Wilford Brimley would say, diabetes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, Wilford. Now, Bob, her dad, he jumped in his car, and he headed down the driveway. Right. And once he arrived at the mailbox, he realized that, you know, Sherry wasn't there, and he got concerned. Yeah, you know, first he was thinking, well, maybe, you know, she's had some kind of episode, so she just maybe got disoriented or whatever, and that's why she hadn't come back. Maybe she parked her car and and then kind of got whatever happens to you. Yeah, with this rare form of diabetes, she had to carry her insulin with her all the time. Right. Just in case something would happen. So, But when he got there, that was not the case. Yep. And the engine in her car was still running, mm-hmm. and the door was wide open. And there were several oh. pieces of mail laying on the, around the mailbox. Yep. On the passenger seat, was Sherry's purse, and they were bare footprints leading from the driver's side door to the mailbox. Right, yeah, she had been wearing those uh, jelly shoes, you know, remember them jelly shoes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, but they were still in the car, so yeah, so she had, they had seen her bare footprints come out and go to the mailbox. Yep, but none coming back to the car. Right. And several pieces of mail laying on the ground next to the mailbox. Right. Yep. It was pretty clear from the beginning that Sherry wouldn't have just left on her own. No. And she, because she had a pretty content and happy life. Right. And she loved her family and was really excited for the summer ahead and everything that was going to happen to her. Well, hell, she was going to go somewhere. She went and drove her car back home and jump in the front yard and jump out and, and leave, you know. And I'd even read or heard somewhere that they at first considered her to be, you know, to run away. Yeah. But, I, you know, she was just too content in her life to do, to do anything yeah, like that. Yeah, why would she do that? All them plans, graduating in two days and all that stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't buy that at all. Yep. But once they examined the scene, it was... Pretty clear to the investigator that Sherry had, had gone from her car to the mailbox and was snatched. Yeah, because the, the feet print run out. Yeah. Feet, foot, foot print? Feet print. Feet print. Foot, <laughs> footprints. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. They just kind of disappeared. Yeah. So, basically, she just disappeared right, right, where, right where they stopped. And from the get-go, the investigators from Lexington County Sheriff's Departments, they organized a manhunt. Yeah. And at the time... In 1985, it was the largest to take place in South Carolina history. Yeah, even this is well before any kind of Amber Alert or any kind of thing like that. But they, as soon as they made the call, and then plus, I guess her medical condition really helped them kick in the gear to come find her because they knew something was up. Yep. And the Smith family, they were doing interviews and stuff, and they were pleading publicly with uh, Sherry's captor to let her go. Right. And they were doing all they could do, but just wait. Yeah, people searching, even brought in planes flying around to see if they could find mm-hmm. anything, couldn't, and nothing. And they just felt helpless, and the lack of control were pretty much unbearable for them. Oh, yeah. And even her father was even quoted as saying for the first time in his life, uh, as a father and protector of my household, he was not in charge of his home. Mm. So I can't imagine, I can't, yeah, I I can't really, imagine that feeling no. to be just... Uh, Feel like a victim. Well, you know, he, you know how he feels because, I mean, well, I guess you don't know how he feels, but well, you know what I mean. I mean, he looked up and saw her. I mean, she's home. Okay, so everything's cool. He saw her My go to the girl, mailbox, yeah. Yeah, you know, your little girl's home, you're good to go. Yep. And then poof. 
gone that quick. I mean, just in the five the, minutes, the time he turned his head till he looked back up, and she was gone. Yeah, wow, it's crazy. Now, we're going to just jump ahead a couple days, Dale. And it was just two days after Sherry disappeared. And this was on the evening of June the 2nd. June the 2nd. Uh, the Smiths got a phone call from an unknown man. And he seemed to... Damn, this has been graduation day, wasn't it? It would have. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I didn't think about that. But yeah, that was graduation day. Man. But they got a phone call from a man who had disguised his voice. And he got almost like it was... He electronically distorted it or something. And he asked to speak to Sherry's mother, Hilda. He told her that Sherry is with me. That's what he told her. And the man described the black and yellow swimsuit Sherry had on under her clothes to prove to Sherry's mama that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a prank. It was real. It was the real deal. Right. And he told her that Sherry was doing well and they were watching TV together. What a creeper, man. Yep. And... He didn't demand any money in exchange for Sherry's return, but he did tell Sherry's mom that they would be receiving a letter the following day in the mail. Now, how crazy is that? That's crazy. Now, detectives, I think, they tried to put a a tap or something on the phone the first time, and it didn't work. Yeah, I don't know. They didn't get it recorded, but they said that uh, that Hilda had written everything down on a piece of paper that he mm-hmm. said. But they they were able to trace the call right to a payphone. It was about twenty miles away. Yeah, you want to explain what a payphone is? Yeah, a payphone is a was a box <laughs> um, that had a phone in it, and you put a dime or a quarter in it, and you placed a phone call. This is a quarter. Yeah, yeah a dime had to be a long time ago. Yeah. I never remember that, and I'm old. Yeah, yeah. Okay, basically yeah. a phone that you could use when you weren't at home because you didn't have one in your pocket yep and but you, you had to pay to use it and if you carried a pager you had to stop and use that thing. that's right yeah good old days beep, beep, beep. but now the payphone was 20 miles from the smith's home in columbia but time was wasn't on their side Dale. and by the time they were able to pinpoint you know the location and travel there whoever made the call was long gone Oh, yeah. Well, you know that. You know, and they said there was no prints or anything, so he, I guess he was gloved up or whatever. But, but you know, it, it's kind of weird um, that he would uh, – you wouldn't think he would have this electronic gizmo out at the payphone. No. You know, I don't, which I don't know what it would look like or if it was just – I don't, I don't know. I was just thinking. It would make you look like you were standing out or something. You know, people would be looking at you if you, you would think, in a, in yeah. a, in a Maybe it's in one of them with the door shut, you know. Could have been. Instead of just the one that's a little mounted on the wall. The Superman though. kind of telephone yeah, the, booth. Yeah, the Doctor Who looking thing. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't watch yet, so I don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> now, the next day, the detectives arrived at the Lexington Post Office, and they began sorting through the mail. Because hmm, you said the letter would be next day, right? Yep. And sure enough, they found a letter addressed to the Smiths. And they handed it to Mr. Smith to just make sure that, you know, to do the legal thing. It was technically delivered. To, yeah, technically delivered. I couldn't think of what, you, what, the, what the term was, but yeah, he got the letter. It's like magically delicious. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, they got the letter, and it was two pages in length, and it was written on paper that looked like it was from a, a yellow legal pad. Right. And it was in Sherry's handwriting, because she had a very distinct handwriting with, you know, in cursive with loops and, you know, just a really nice handwriting. And across the top of the page, Dale, last will and testament. Holy shit. Yes. It also had a 6185 and 310 AM mm-hmm. right across the top. Yep. Well, I think he uh, and I think he told her when the, the letter was coming that it would definitely have 6185 and 310 AM so yep. that he would know or that she would know it was a legit deal. All right, Dale. We have Sherry's letter titled Last Will and Testament that she wrote to her parents and my daughter Jessie has so graciously volunteered to read it for us. I love you mommy, daddy, Robert, Dawn, and Richard and everyone else and all other friends and relatives. I'll be with my father now so please please don't worry. Just remember my witty personality and great special times we all shared together. Please don't even let this ruin your lives. Just keep living one day at a time for Jesus. Some good will come out of this. My thoughts will always be with you, 
and in you. Casket closed. I love you all so damn much. Sorry, Dad. I had to cuss for once. Jesus forgave me. Richard, sweetie, I really did and always will love you and treasure our special moments. I ask one thing, though. Accept Jesus as your personal Savior. My family has been the greatest influence on my life. Sorry about the crew's money. Somebody please go in my place. I am sorry if I ever disappointed you in any way. I only wanted to make you proud of me because I have always been proud of my family. Mom, Dad, Robert, and Dawn, there's so much I want to say that I should have said before now. I love y'all. I know y'all love me and will miss me very much, but if y'all stick together like we always did, y'all can do it. Please do not become hard or upset. Everything works out for the good for those that love the Lord. All my love always, Sharon, Sherry, F. Smith. I love y'all with all my heart. P.S. Nana, I love you so much. I kind of always felt like your favorite. You are mine. I love you a lot. Wow. Man, that gives me chills. Yeah, that gives me cold chills reading that letter, Dale. I'm going to go get a Kleenex. It's rough. Yep. Now, Sherry's dad was first to read the letter, and Dale, he was pretty devastated. I don't imagine, man. That's just awful. But he refused to abandon hope that his daughter, you know, might still come home. Right. And he dreaded the most of telling Hill to his wife. Right. What the letter said. I can't even imagine. But now the letter was sent to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Crime Lab, and they examined it by a forensic document examiner for any clues, you know, like fibers, fingerprints, handprints, or any kind of discrepancies of spelling or handwriting. I mean, they pretty much went over it with a fine tooth comb. Right. And another phone call came through the Smiths that afternoon, Dale, the day they received the letter. Have you received the mail today? Uh, yes, I have. Do you believe me now? Well, I'm not really sure I believe you because I haven't had any word from Sherry. And I need to know... Sherry is well. You don't know in two or three days. Why two or three days? Call the search call. This dude is just... Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> now, the same distorted voice was on the other end, and the man asked Hilda if they had received the mail. And she told him they had. And he asked Hilda if he believed him. And she replied that she was not sure because she had not heard from Sherry and did not know if it was she was really okay or not. Right. And the man replied that she would know in two or three days. Which is really weird. Yeah. I mean, that's a hell of a reply. Now, that evening, the same day, the Smiths received another call, and this one was kind of ominous. I want to tell you one of the things. Sherry is now part of me. The man said to Sherry's mom, Hilda, uh, and I'll quote this, he said, Sherry is now part of me, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, our souls are one now. So I don't know what he meant by that. I don't know if that was the, the moment that you know he'd killed Sherry or what. That is just really damn creepy. Yeah. That sounds like something that uh, that vampire guy said. Yeah, but he was just pretty much taunting the Smiths. Yeah, so he's done called them three or four times. Yeah, and sent a, made her write us a letter. Well, I don't know if he made, well, I mean, hell, he had to make her write it and then send her the letter in her own handwriting. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Now on June the fourth, the Smiths received another call. This time, Sherry's sister Dawn spoke to Sherry's captor. And he told her... So Dawn was an older sister. Dawn was the older sister. Okay. Sherry was the middle child. I want to tell you one thing. Sherry is now part of me. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I'm so the one now. And he told Dawn, he told her that at 3.10 a.m. on Saturday, June the 1st, Sherry wrote the letter. Then at 4.58 a.m., he said that their soul, they became one soul. So he's basically telling her he killed her at 5 o'clock. That's pretty much what I'm getting out of that. Yeah, that's the way I'm reading it. Yeah, when Dawn asked him what he meant by that, he told her not to ask any questions. 
and he asked that Sheriff James Metz of Lexington County Sheriff's Department stop searching for Sherry. And but in the background, they, I mean, they could hear Sherry's mom Hilda pleading for him not to kill her daughter. Mm. I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, the the hell you would go through to experience that. I can't imagine. And this dude's just getting off on this. And then he tells them Sherry loves and misses y'all. He said, "Good night, and get rest tonight." Good God. Yeah. Now, on June the fifth, which is the next day. Yep. They get a phone call again, and he tells Hilda to listen carefully, and then proceed to give details and directions to a specific location. Hello. And he ended the call saying, we're waiting. God chose us. So now the detectives, they leave the Smith's home and they go to the directions provided that he told them to go to. Yeah, basically he gave them what, like just uh, turn by turn directions where to go, right? Yeah, pretty much. Sherry's mom, Hilda, begged them to let her go along, but they told her to stay at the house. Oh, that yeah. it wouldn't be a good idea because you don't know what you're going to find. Right. No. But, could be nothing, could be your worst nightmare. Exactly. Yeah. But what they found confirmed everyone's worst fears and nightmares. Sherry's body was exactly where the man said it would be. And it was behind an old Masonic Lodge in Saluna County. And it was 18 miles west of the Smith home. Wow. Now, Dale, this time of year in May in South Carolina, it was stifling hot. 100 degrees every day. Right. And the autopsy showed that Sherry had been dead for about four days. And in fact, the medical examiner uh, estimated that Sherry had been killed about 12 hours after being kidnapped. So pretty much she just had time to... Write that letter. Yeah. And be tortured or whatever. Whatever, no telling he, whatever he did. And, and that was it. Damn. So uh, this whole time he's calling her, she's dead the whole oh, time. Oh, yeah, the, the whole time. time they're calling the family. And, and giving them some kind of hope that she might be alive. Right. Saying that she's watching TV and um, doing all this she's stuff. She's missing y'all and yeah. all that. Mess. Yeah. But now, like I said, they were unable to determine the cause of death, but a residue of duct tape on Sherry's face suggested that she had died of suffocation. And pieces of her hair had been cut off because the tape had gotten stuck in it. Mm-hmm. And this indicated to the detectives that whoever killed Sherry knew what he was doing. As any clues left, you know, on the body might lead them to him. Right. So, he, you know, he was kind of covering his tracks or doing, trying to, you know, attempting it anyway. Yeah, because any fingerprints or stuff like that would be, would stay on the tape or whatever. Yeah. Now, due to the extended period of Sherry's time spent in elements, no forensic evidence was recovered. I mean, it was just, you know, too hot and it Yeah. Decomp had already started. Yep, and insects and everything had got to her, too. Right. And they couldn't even prove that Sherry had been sexually assaulted. It was that bad. Wow. And when the man said on the phone that he and Sherry had become one soul on June 1st at 4.58 a.m., detectives assumed that that was the time he had killed her. Right, just like we said. Yep. Now, this is when um, FBI agent John Douglas, he is a pretty famous and renowned a serial killer profiler. Yes. Yeah, he's like top notch. He came up with a detailed profile of Sherry's killer. And he categorized him, Dale, as an organized killer and said he was sophisticated in his methods and had been planning this murder for a while. And it was possible that he'd committed sex crimes or crimes of a similar nature before. Mm. And, And according to their profile... He would be young in his mid to late 20s or early 30s, white, homely, and overweight. God, that sounds like me. <laughs> Except not in my 20s or 30s. <laughs> and he had likely been married, but now divorced or separated. He was above average intelligence with a knowledge of electronics, which, you know, he used to alter his voice for the phone calls. Right. So, you know, they 
they were using everything at their disposal to you know to profile this guy and said he was not impulsive or one to take chances you know and from listening to the recordings or phone calls the fbi agents and detectives you know that were working the case convinced that he was reading from a script that he had written and the giveaway was that he sometimes stumbled and would go back to the beginning of a sentence and start over saying the exact same phrase again so he was pretty organized yeah, now wasn't uh, John Douglas and uh, Ron Walker where they were kind of like the guys that they based Mindhunter off of? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, a careful examination of the evidence led you know John Douglas to the conclusion that this was not one of a one-off for Sherry's killer, and in all likelihood, he would kill again if not captured. And he was drunk on the feelings of power and control that m- manipulated Sherry's family. The, the you know what the way they were he was treating them it gave him power right oh, definitely. made him you know and he was getting off more on these phone calls I think than doing the actual murder mm-hmm. seems seems that way now yeah and he loved them feelings he was getting yeah the way it was so it's just out. like prolonged torture just on and on and on now get this Dale even after Sherry's body was found her killer was not done I guess rubbing salt in the family's wounds oh no now he enjoyed. Speaking to Dawn on the phone, that was Sherry's older sister. And sometimes he would mix up Dawn and Sherry, mixed her, I guess he would call her Sherry, mixed her names up. Yeah, he's doing that on purpose. Yeah, and he accidentally said that everything had gotten out of hand and all he wanted to do was make love to Dawn. And when Dawn questioned this, he corrected himself saying he meant Sherry. Right. Dawn had caught on to this. She she knew he was just He's playing her, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she was, she's a smart girl. I've seen interviews with her, and she's she's pretty smart. Right. The Sherry's funeral, had, her date had been set. He chose that evening to make the next call to the Smith's house, the day of the funeral. Hmm. And once again, he spoke to Dawn. It was like, uh, I think, right after they got home, I believe. Yeah. Hello? I'm Sherry. Will you call? From who? Sherry. Yes. Dawn, what's the break today? What? What's the break today? Okay. Well, I kept you off guard. Well, yeah, because they said it was from Sherry. No, I said uh, concerned here. Everybody screwed up here. Excuse my friend. Okay, I'll, I'll listen carefully. Okay. Donna, I'm, I'm real afraid now and everything. Uh, can you handle this? I'll tell you how she does. Yeah. I took duct tape and wrapped it all the way around her head and just suffocated her. I don't know why. I just feel that the best thing for you to do is give yourself up now. Donna, God bless the time. This time, he wanted to be particularly cruel. He described to Dawn the details of Sherry's death. <clears throat> yeah, I think he ever actually asked her if she was strong enough to, to hear how she died. Yeah. And she said yes. And even including various disgusting ways he sexually assaulted her. Hmm. Yeah, he's a sick individual. And he, he told Dawn that he'd let Sherry make her own decisions regarding her death as if somehow justified his, his actions. He let her choose what time she would die, and he also gave her the choice of dying by shooting, drug overdose, or suffocation. You think that's true? I don't know. I, I ain't buying that. I mean, it, it makes it for a good story for him to feed her that, but I think he knew what he was going to do. Yeah. Who would want, I mean, but she chose, he said Sherry chose the last option, which was suffocation. Who would want to die by suffocation? That well, would be, especially the way he's going to do it. Yeah. He told her that he wrapped duct tape around her head and she died. Yeah, so basically he took, took an electric cord and tied her hands to the bed frame and then took a roll of duct tape and started at her neck and rolled it around her head all the way up, mm-hmm. all the way up her head until she suffocated. Now, who in the hell is going to choose that? I wouldn't. I mean, I, I just shoot it, put a bullet in my head. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I ain't buying that. Mm-mm. You know, and... I know they were saying, you know, that don't ask her how she, you know, what was going on. She basically just sat there and took it, and she knew she was going to be with the Lord, and she wished she didn't cry, she didn't scream, she didn't fight him. She just just went. Yep. But that's all why he said, you know. So. And then he said uh, Sherry died right there in front of him. God Almighty. And then he told her God was ready to accept her as an angel, and the phone call ended after that. So that's why she had tape in her hair and all that, because he just basically – just wrapped around her head till she died. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, exactly two weeks after Sherry was kidnapped from outside her home and there, right there at the mailbox, her killer struck again. 
like just like the FBI said he would. Uh, but this time, he snatched a nine-year-old girl named Deborah May Hilmick from her front yard near Richland County. Now, this is pretty pretty brazen right here because this is like a, you know, before what well, was like a 700-foot, um, you know, from the house. This is right in the front yard. Yep. And, and this is in a small trailer park with like uh, 12 trailers in it, you know, just kind of a small thing, you know, where I get, I'm sure they're pretty tight in there. So, mm-hmm. I mean, hell, it couldn't have been far from other house at all. No, this is a shallow mobile home park, and I've looked and tried to find it, but I don't guess it exists anymore. Hmm. But it was 24 miles from the Smith home, and it was in broad daylight. Yeah. And like Sherry, Deborah was a pretty blonde blue-eyed girl but she was only nine years old and she had been playing outside with her younger siblings well actually her younger brother named woody yeah and her father was just inside the house i think he had just got home from work yeah and the well i won't say the bad part but another heartbreaking part is they hadn't lived there but about two weeks and uh the mother was getting ready to go to work one of her friends was going to pick her up and uh, take her to work because the dad was at work and he was waiting to, you know, to get home. And usually what happens is the lady who took her to work would keep the kids till the dad got home. And so usually when she come to pick her up to go to work, they all get in the car, take mom to work, and then they go hang out at her house until dad gets home. Mm-hmm. Well, they were all going to get in the car. And then dad got home right before they left. So the one kid went with them. The other two stayed, decided they wanted to stay and play. Yeah. So mom and the and the girl and the other kid left to go to work dad just getting off work him and the guy who bro, uh, drove him home went inside so he went and changed to get out of his work clothes while the kids playing in the front yard and while they're sitting he's in there talking to his buddy this guy drives up and grabs his kid yeah so and it was a neighbor that spotted him yeah so you, if it would have been a normal day they wouldn't have been there yeah i mean they missed i don't know it's just that's what's crazy. Yeah, so that's that's the heartbreaking part. You know, if they would just got in the car, their mom and went like they was going to. Deborah will be here today. Yeah. More than likely. But it was a neighbor that spotted him because he was in his house, I think, making some orange juice or something. Frozen orange juice. Yeah, looking out the window. The window. <laughs> looking out the window. Wow. Yeah, because he didn't have his air conditioning on that day. He didn't have no air conditioning. Oh, okay. His window's open. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so he heard what so was going on. So you know it was warm, <laughs> warm as hell yeah. on that trail. <laughs> That's why he was making some frozen orange juice. <laughs> yeah. But he heard the uh, Deborah Helmick scream. Yeah. And he went outside to, to see what was happening. Right, and he ran across the road and beat on the door and said, did you see that guy grab your daughter? But uh, their dad, he even heard the scream. He thought they were just playing. Yeah. You know, called kids out in the yard playing. But he came out and said, uh, that man just rode off with your daughter. He just kidnapped your daughter. Yeah. And they took off after him. Yep. Said they, you know, took it, jumped in the car and took off. Even went down to the intersection, was stopping cars coming both ways, seeing if they had seen the car that the mm-hmm. guy was uh, describing, because he'd seen it all happen right there in front of him. And uh, he even said that uh, they threw her in. He threw her in the back of the car, and she was kicking, trying to kick the roof, you know. And then he actually threw her in there, and she didn't move after that. Right. So I didn't know if she would banged her head or what, but yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Man. I mean, that's pretty damn brave. So now they got Deborah May Helmick missing. Now detectives need to get in contact with this kidnapper. They were going to pull out all the stops. And so whoever killed Sherry and kidnapped Deborah loved attention. Yep. So they come up with a plan. Now the agents, they tried to lure him out of hiding with a memorial service for Sherry at the cemetery. With Dawn playing a central role, they actually made put her up as bait. And... Mm-hmm. Because he had it bad for her. Yeah. And she showed up at the memorial service at the cemetery with one of uh, Sherry's favorite stuffed animals, which was a koala bear. Mm. And it showed her holding the koala bear, putting some flowers on uh, Sherry's on grave. grave. So this they used this to try to get him out. Yeah, and see if he would actually attend the service, I guess. Yeah, they were there taking pictures of everything. Yeah, he's probably getting ever facing the crowd trying to see mm-hmm. if, if he was actually there and wanting to know if he'd be paying close attention to the media right and pretty much patting himself on the back for having evaded capture hmm. and if the mo- the local media was big enough a story of the memorial service there would be a good chance he would attend and stand out you know stand in the back you know silently just sort of 
you know, gloat over what he had done. Yeah, just see if he could, uh, like, fit into the crowd and stuff. And just. But the memorial service was just what the agents hoped for because members of the community came from far and wide to support Smith, the Smith family. And at the instructions of uh, John Douglas, Don brought that small stuffed koala bear. And if Sherry's killer did attend the service, he would see Don with it. And with any luck, you know, he would try to do something. Now, just after midnight on June the 23rd, the Smiths got another call. So I'm guessing he didn't show up. No. Yeah. Well, they do. They probably took down everybody's license plate or whatever it was coming in and see yeah. if they could run it. But I'm sure they run this on the news. Yeah. Yeah. Now, while Sherry's killer had not been brought out in the open by the memorial service, it clearly woke something in him, and no doubt he wanted to go to the service, but didn't feel it was safe. Hmm. Instead, he satisfied his need for attention by calling the Smiths again, and Dawn answered the phone. Damn. Of course, she never wanted to speak to him, but kept keeping him on the line as a vital tracking down, you know. So she's just, just being trying a, to get some information out of him, yeah. She's she just being a damn trooper, ain't she? She is. I mean, my God. And as he had a number of times before, he brought God into the conversation. He And he found playing God to be particularly satisfying to him. And I think that's what he, you know, he had a God complex. Mm-hmm. Perhaps, you know, citing God in his phone calls and making him feel less guilty. And, but I think it's more likely that, you know, he knew the Smiths were dedicated Christians. Right. And he, he got pleasure from bringing God into this little antics. Now, a further indication that he was beginning to feel untouchable was the fact that he no longer distorted his voice for the phone calls. So now he's just a regular voice. He's getting cocky. Yeah. Yeah, he thinks he's invisible. Invincible. Invisible or invincible? Invincible. Okay. And the first thing he said to Dawn was particularly alarming. He told her, he said, God wants you to join Sherry Fay. And he said it's only a matter of time. She could not be protected forever. So he was... He had a thing for Dawn. Yeah, he told her it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next week, it could be next year. Yeah. But then mm-hmm. he but then he changed the subject of what he really wanted to talk about. Uh, he asked her if he had heard of Deborah May Helmick. And at first she did not recall. Then she remembered a young girl that had been abducted in Richland County. And he told her, said, you know, listen carefully. Then he rattled off a series of directions like he did before with Sherry. Right. You know, go here, turn here, turn here. Go past know. that, do this. Yeah. Right. Yeah, just like he'd done with uh, Sherry's mom, Hilda. Yeah. And then he ended the call saying that Deborah May is waiting. God forgive us all. Oh, shit. And it was almost like deja vu for the detectives. You know, they were just going to follow these directions. And knowing what they would find when they reached the destination. You know, because, you know, they knew they were going to find some a, a dead body there. Yep. No doubt about it. Yep. And sure enough, I was just off the dirt road, and uh, in the thick brush lay the body of nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick. Yep. Pretty much the same, in the same condition as Sherry was. Said she had pieces of hair laying around, even one that had a barrette on it, a little yep. barrette and stuff. And she was in bad shape, too, as far as decomp already setting in. So mm-hmm. he probably killed her pretty quick, too. Yeah, she had on all the clothes that she, you know, disappeared in. But one thing about it, Dale, she had on some uh, women's panties over her panties. Yeah, kind of weird. Yeah, like women's. Uh, had some sexy drawers on top of her little cotton panties. Yeah. Or whatever. Which was very, very weird. Yeah, this dude's weird. Yeah, he's out there, man. Now, the killer is, is smart, but not too smart. Because, uh, you know, he was taunting the, the Smiths. And as it was covered... In the FBI profile of him, he was a above average intelligence. Right. And he knew not to leave any evidence on the bodies that could be tracked to him. And his fun was about to come to an end when he found a piece of evidence that pretty much placed him directly in the hands of the detectives was that letter that Sherry wrote. Right. That last will and testament. And what happened was it was on a, a those yellow legal pads. And there was a good chance, you know, the killer had written you know things on it on the previous sheets of the pad that right. left you know indentations Ooh. on the sheets yeah that you know sherry had used and they found a forensic document examiner his name was mickey dawson and he used he used what a, they called an an electrostatic detection apparatus or eda yeah <laughs> on the letter to detect any of those sorts of indentations right so it's kind of similar to like if you have the pad it just the pad you know you take your pencil lay it sideways and go over it lightly it kind of shows up what was written on mm-hmm. the page before 
But I guess if you just only have the page before, then you have to use this more to pick up the indentions. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And the machine detected a list of names and telephone numbers, and it appeared that it was a call in case of emergency sort of list hmm. that they found on it. And one of the numbers was nearly complete, only missing the final digit. And it began with the 205. So it's an Alabama area code. Yes, state of Alabama. And the next three digits were 837, which was the exchange for Huntsville, Alabama. And detectives had nine out of ten digits they needed, and there were only nine possibilities for the tenth digit. Oh, yeah, so that was easy to yeah. try all those. Yep. And they tested the phone number with nine different options for the tenth digit until someone picked up. I mean, just... Damn, lucky. Yeah. And it was a young man who answered the phone, and detectives asked if he had any connections to South Carolina. And he told him that, yes, his parents lived there, and the young man was, the young man's father was Ellis Shepard, who lived just 15 miles from the Smith's home. Damn. Yep. Cold chills. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Now, they went to Ellis Shepard, and he had no clue how he could help detectives, but he agreed to speak with them. And he told them that he had been on vacation with his wife when Sherry had disappeared, and they proved that, you know, so he was. Yeah, they traveled quite a bit. Yep. Him and his wife. But then they played Shepard a recording of the killer's last phone calls to the Smiths, in which the voice was not distorted, and immediately they knew who it was. Yep. And they even said, that's Larry Gene Bell. And he was a house sitter for them. I think he was kind of a house sitter, handyman. Yeah, and, he worked with Ellis a little bit. Yeah. And stuff, yeah. And uh, when they would leave, they would leave, be gone for weeks at a time, and he would stay at the house. Right, taking care of the house. And he had been house-sitting while they were on vacation. And on examination of Shepard's phone records, when they were away, detectives discovered that some of the phone calls to the Smiths after Sherry was kidnapped were made from the Shepard's home. So they had him, and they had... They got him right there. Right there, Larry Jean Bell. Yeah. And Shepard, the homeowner, explained that he had left a list of phone numbers for Bell while they were away, and the list included the number of his son who lived in Alabama, so that's why that number was on that pad. Yeah, left it. That was uh, the, um, what was her name, Shepard? Yeah, yeah the Shepard said that uh, they kept that yellow legal pad by their phone at all times to take down messages and stuff. Mm -hmm. So him using that same pad is what got him. Yep. Now, we're going to get into Larry Gene Bell. Now, there's just a li there's just little information on him in his childhood, but he was born in Ralph, Alabama, on October the 30th, 1949, and was one of five children. Now, the Bell family never settled in one place for very long, and they moved a lot between Alabama, South Carolina, Mississippi. But Bell graduated high school in Mississippi and went to trade school to become an electrician. And while he was training, he finished and he moved to Columbia, South Carolina, where he got married and had one son. He married like a 16-year-old girl or something. Yeah, he was 20 at the time. Right. So he married a little young girl. Now in 1970. I wonder if she was blonde and blue hair. Blue hair. I'd like, I'd like, blonde and blue eyed. I'd like to find out. Yeah, because I hadn't seen that information anywhere. Mm -hmm. Now in 1970, Bell joined the Marines, but was enrolled for less than a year, and he would be discharged for accidentally shooting himself in the knee while cleaning a gun. He wasn't nowhere very long. No, uh -uh. Now after this short stay in the Marines, he worked for a brief period of time for the Department of Corrections at Columbia, South Carolina. And in 1972, he moved with his family to Rock Hill, South Carolina. And in 1976, he and his wife divorced. You know, she probably got for custody. Yeah, he, yes, she probably did. Yeah. So Rock Hill, that's, that's pretty damn close. Yeah, that's just right down below Charlotte from here. That's not far at all. Now, when Bale picked up Ellis Shepard and his wife from the airport after their vacation, he was not himself, Dale. He seemed nervous and on edge, and he had not he had not shaved, and he had lost weight. I think he lost up about 10, 15 10, pounds. Yeah. yeah. And all he wanted to do was talk about the missing Smith girl. Right. Sherry Smith. And all this is before they had actually heard the recording, right? Yeah, they'd been, yeah. yeah. Now, Bell was a textbook example of a killer beginning to lose his cool. The behaviors he was exhibiting were precisely what uh, John Douglas, the FBI behavior analysis, looked for when trying to track down a killer deal 
this all goes back to the profile and man that shit was spot on yeah i mean almost Everything that he said in that profile was true. Yeah, he had him down to a T. Yeah, I mean, everything. But the only thing they had slightly off was his age. But everything else was dead on. Yeah. He was 35, and they guessed he would be in his mid to late 20s or early 30s. But well, other than that, close. yeah. But they were, however, correct in regarding Bell and as white, slightly overweight, even though he had lost a little bit of weight. And he was divorced and was intelligent and good and, knowledge of electronics. Yep. So they had him I mean, down damn. to <laughs> Yep. Now, Bell's past also included sexually motivated crimes. He had been caught harassing women over the phone before, making threats of a sexual nature. And he had even also attempted to kidnap a female student from the University of South Carolina, but failed. Yeah, at knife point. Yep. Now, on June the 27th of 1985, 28 days after kidnapping and murdering Sherry Smith, Bell was arrested. And police found the evidence in the shepherd's home, which incriminated Bell. They found six long blonde hairs that were almost definitely Sherry's. And I don't believe they were forensically tested, but they were said to believe microscopically similar to her hair. Easy for you to say. Yep. And they they did not belong to Mrs. Shepherd or anybody the shepherds knew. So I'm sure this is pre DNA stuff. So yeah, or just right before. I mean, yeah. This was the 80s, so. But Bill denied having anything to do with the kidnapping and deaths of Sherry Smith and Deborah Deborah Helmick, but rather just outright denying, and he claimed that it was the bad Larry Jean Bell who was guilty of the murder. So I guess he was trying to do some kind of insanity defense or something here. Yeah, starting early. Yeah, right from the get-go. Now, in February of 1986, Larry Jean Bell went to trial for the murder of Sherry Smith and he made a scene during his six hour long testimony, yelling and making bizarre comments like the following Mona Lisa is a man and silence is golden, my friend. He's crazy. Or he was he was putting on the crazy. Yeah, no doubt about it. Right. But the jury didn't buy it at all. Yeah, he he was even doing it pre pre jury when they were trying to pick a jury and the and the judge told him he wasn't putting up with it and he said, Well, you can do what you want to and I'll send you out of here, but it's not gonna stop me from getting this jury and getting this trial started. Then he kinda calmed down a little bit after he said it wasn't gonna work, but then in during the trial he'd done it too. So and, he started it all back up, yeah. And even when he was in the witness box, he wouldn't even sit down. <laughs> no, because he said there is no chair no chairs at the gates of hell. So I will not sit down. <laughs> Jeez. But the jury deliberated for just 47 minutes, and they returned verdicts of guilty on both charges of kidnapping and first-degree murder in the case of Sherry Smith. Yep. And Bell was sentenced to death. Dum, dum, dum. Now, he was tried separately in 87 for the kidnapping of Deborah Helmick. Yep. And the jury in that trial came back with the same verdict, guilty on both counts. Yeah, he didn't try all the goofiness in this one. He just kind of sat there and took it. Yeah. I guess he said it didn't matter now. He wasn't getting out of this. He gets he got everything he deserved. But now, it wasn't just Sherry's family and Deborah's family and friends who were shaken by this of Larry Jean Bell. I mean, the whole state of South Carolina was on the edge. Can you imagine? From the time Sherry was kidnapped to the day he was arrested. I mean, it was just, I mean, you know, there's, a, there's somebody out there kidnapping the kids. Out of the front yard. It ain't like, you know, <laughs> and this is back when, you know, you will be home before the, you know, the street lights come on and, you know, we were all out ripping roam, you know, all over everywhere and hanging out and just be home before dark and be home for supper and this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But man, I'm sure this changed everything around there. Oh, I'm sure it did. Oh, like a month of terror. Larry Jean Bell was given a choice between being executed by lethal injection or by the electric chair. And he ultimately chose the chair. He even said that uh, that he wanted the electric chair because it would be quicker and he would be closer. He would, be, he would get to his angels quicker. Yeah. He was sick, man. So right then, they should have just strapped him down and gave him a little bit of a shot at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Real slow. No. A slow death. You can cut that up. You don't do <laughs> shit on this dude. Yeah. Yeah, I can't believe this guy. But now, on October the 4th, 1996, after 10 years on death row, 46-year-old Bell died silently in South Carolina's electric chair. He had no parting words as he left this world behind. Couldn't happen to a better fella. Yep. Now... Just some side notes of Larry Jean Bell. He still remains a suspect in cases of two women 
uh, 26-year-old Sandy Elaine Cornett and 21-year-old Denise Newsom Porch. Both of these women disappeared from Charlotte, North Carolina. Sandy was engaged to a co-worker of Bell's, and apparently Bell had in, attended a party at her apartment before, and she was last seen on November of 1984. This was prior to Sherry Smith. Right. And, but, and Denise managed the Yorktown Apartments, where she also lived on Tybola Road in Charlotte. Right. And the last time anybody saw her was when she was showing a man around Yorktown Apartments on July 31st, 1975. She had left her husband a note letting him know that she, what she was doing, and despite an extensive search, Denise was never seen again, but she was declared legally dead in 1982. Wow. And Bell became a suspect in Denise's disappearance after he was convicted of the murders of Sherry Smith and Deborah Helmick. And as it turned out, Bell had been living just 300 yards from the Yorktown apartments when Denise disappeared in 1975. So I'd say it's a pretty good chance. Pretty good chance, pretty yeah. Pretty good chance, yeah. And I did see um, somewhere that Denise actually, somebody was looking into her disappearance, you know, because she was never found. And they took some uh, DNA, somebody was investigating from her sister, and they did eventually find the recover her body yes it was uh it was in chapel hill mm -hmm. yeah somebody had found i guess a jane doe and she was there and then they finally put it together then so mm -hmm. she was laid to rest finally so i think they had some skeletal remains or something yes mm -hmm. that's it but now just a little bit of aftermath dale dawn smith this is sherry smith she didn't let grief take over her life she decided she would enter the 1986 miss south carolina pageant as sherry always encouraged her to do and she was crowned the winner and she was go on to be the second runner up in the 1987 Miss America competition. Wow. So it's a very very beautiful young lady. Yeah. But now Dawn is a Christian singer, songwriter and motivational speaker. She's wrote a book called Grace So Amazing, a true story of God's grace in the midst of life-shattering tragedy. And it's a tribute to Sherry and a last testament to the pivotal role her faith played in guiding her and Sherry's murder. Yeah, strong lady, and I can't believe—I still can't believe how she just kept her kept her cool talking to that dude so many times. You know. Yeah, she's a rock man, ain't no doubt about it. But that is the case of Larry Jean Bell. The good Larry Jean Bell or the bad Larry Jean Bell? Which Larry Jean Bell? Larry Jean Bell. <laughs> Piece of trash. Yeah. Good I'm, riddance. Yeah, I'm glad he's not on this earth anymore. Yeah, I can't. I could not fathom something like that happened to one of my daughters, and then some asshole calling you. To remind you about it every day. And you want to reach through the phone and just strangle him, <laughs> strangle him right there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So good riddance. All right, Dale. We are going to get out of here. Let's do it, man. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is the, the Crack, Crack House, House Chronicles. Chronicles.